excellent uh, webinar in store for you, and pleased to have folks registered from about six states joining us tonight, so we welcome everybody again. I do want to remind you that following tonight's presentation, we will have the opportunity for a question and answer time uh, for the presentation port that you can ask our presenter and any of our panelists any questions that you'd like. There's a, it's, it's simple for you to do that. You can raise your hand, or you can either type out your question. Either way, we'll be able to know that you have a question. And trust me, we'll give you plenty of opportunity to ask your questions to our presenter and our panelists here tonight. Well, tonight's topic is on equine nutrition and physiology and how that plays into the application and the use of Sweet Pro products and Equilix and Equipride, as well as the Redmond Natural Minerals. Tonight, our presenter that we are pleased to have with us is Dr. Kerry Hammer out of North Dakota State University. Now, Dr. Hammer's training comes from excellent institutions like Iowa State University, as well as... Uh, of course, as well as North Dakota State University. Currently, she's the Assistant Professor of Equine Studies at North Dakota State in Fargo. She's been featured in multiple publications, and so tonight we are pleased to have with us Dr. Carrie Hammer from North Dakota State University, your presenter for tonight's webinar entitled Equine Nutrition and Physiology. Dr. Hammer? Thank you, Justin. I am glad to be with everybody here tonight. And... Uh, Hopefully everyone can hear me all right and that the volume's good. Sounds good. As Justin mentioned, I'm going to be speaking a little bit tonight on nutrition and physiology in horses, a little bit on kind of the feeds we feed, what they do in the horse, and hopefully give you a little under, better understanding of kind of how these feeds are utilized, what the horse's body does with them, and then we'll talk at the end about kind of a few common disorders um, and help us think about how nutrition plays into the role of these disorders and what we can do to help manage and or prevent them from occurring. Just to give you a basic outline of what I'm going to go over tonight, um, we'll start with just some basic anatomy, um, kind of entry level into what the horse's GI tract looks like and some good landmarks. We'll then move into some feeding guidelines for horses and kind of how we think about the horse in terms of their working class or their maintenance um, requirements. And then, as I mentioned, we'll finish up with some abnormalities. So if we start out with kind of basic anatomy of the horse, first thing and the first part in terms of anatomy that a feed particle is going to encounter um, is going to be the mouth of that horse. And, uh, you know, when we think about the horse in general, we think about them um, as a classification that is termed a non-ruminant grazing herbivore. Sounds like a lot of big fancy words, but what it basically means is that they're not a ruminant. A cow, um, deer, sheep, goats would all fall into our ruminant category. A horse is different. They have a monogastric, meaning one stomach. So they're much more similar to humans, um, pigs, dogs, cats in the first part of their stomachs and intestines. However, their hind gut, so the back part of the gastrointestinal tract, is a little bit more similar to what we think of as a ruminant animal. And that's where they're able to ferment grass, hay, um, and utilize the forages that um, our other simple stomached animals can't. You know, our dogs, cats, pigs aren't able to utilize grass, hay, um, and forage of that type where our horse can utilize those for nutrients and actually utilize that as a big portion of their diet. This slide that you should be seeing um, may look like a scary hodgepodge of um, anatomical organs, um, but it's kind of laid out in a line drawing of what we're going to go through. As I mentioned a little bit ago, the first thing that a feed particle is going to encounter is the horse's mouth. It's going to move down through the esophagus and into the stomach, then through all the parts of the long, twisting, turning, small intestine. And then finally, you can see towards the bottom half of this page all these big, sacculated, balloon-type organ, and that's all of the large intestine. And that's where all this fermentation is going to occur when we talk about the fiber and the utilization of forage. And 
And I probably should say before we get too much further too, if anyone's having any trouble with the, the pictures loading or it taking a while on your computer to load, just uh, be sure to raise your hand or type in a little message here to let me know to slow down in between slides so I can make sure that everything gets loaded on your screen and you're able to see the pictures before I start talking about them. All right, so if we start in the horse's mouth, horses have very strong and sensitive lips. Um, however, they're not incredibly mobile. They're pretty fixed um, in terms of, I think, of especially, you know, cattle and some of our other animals that seem to be able to move their lips around quite a bit. Horses are a little more fixed, but their lips are incredibly strong. And they use those lips to help sort their feed and move things to their teeth to be able to bite off and blades of grass or pieces of grain as they sort that out of their meal. Their tongue is going to be used to push the food to their cheek teeth where they can grind it up. And then they also have three big salivary glands that are going to produce about three gallons of saliva a day. Now horses are a little bit different than some of our other animals that have some enzymes in their saliva that will start to break down the feed particles. The horse's saliva does not contain those enzymes but mainly is just used for lubrication and kind of as a buffer to help kind of smooth out the acid that occurs in the stomach of the horse. So it's a very important aspect. It not only helps the feed move down the esophagus and into the stomach, but it helps buffer the stomach against the acid, which can be a problem later when we talk about some of these disorders. If we move on to the esophagus, um, this is what's going to connect the back of the horse's throat to their stomach. It's about four to five feet in length and mainly lies on the left side of the horse's neck. If you've ever watched um, a veterinarian pass a stomach tube into a horse or if you've ever had the misfortune of having a horse that suffers from choke, a lot of times you can see the bulge on the left side of the horse's neck, either of the stomach tube passing down or as a ball of feet if something is stuck there. This tube's very muscular, and it's what helps to push the food basically from the mouth to the stomach. There's nothing added or changed to the feed at this point. There's no enzymes, no digestion really occurring here. It's simply the transport highway of getting the food from the mouth down to the stomach. The stomach of the horse is where our first real kind of process of digestion of feed particles begins. Now the horse's stomach is actually quite small. It holds only approximately three to five gallons. I always tell my students in class and usually bring in a small um, five gallon gas can to help them kind of visualize the size of that. Think of a 11 to 1200 pound horse, um, that small gas can is just a you know pretty small component in their body and we have to think about that when we're feeding them large meals that they really don't have huge capacity on the other hand you know a cow's rumen takes up a huge amount of the inside of their abdomen and is easily 10 times larger than the stomach of the horse now i mentioned that this is where kind of the digestive process is getting started and there are enzymes and acid that are secreted continuously in the stomach. That secretion will increase when a horse eats, so it increases in response to a meal, but it is secreted continuously. And you'll kind of hear me talk about this as a reoccurring theme throughout this um, seminar tonight when we talk about enzymes in the horse and kind of how their GI tract developed. But this is kind of evolutionary response and that horses were developed to be grazing continuously. And so the idea that the horse evolved to have food in its stomach and intestines all the time, um, you see that with these enzymes that are secreted continuously, thinking the animal evolved to think that there would be food there all the time. And that's where we start to have some problems sometimes when we do have an empty stomach or an empty small intestine. Um, but still these enzymes that digest proteins um, are there being secreted. The 
next thing that the food is going to pass to after it leaves the stomach, so the stomach will start to break down kind of the bigger particles of feed. Really the enzymes in the stomach work highly on proteins, so start to begin digestion of the proteins. Um, but then the food is going to move into the small intestine. Small intestine of the horse is really long. Um, I tell students figure about 80 feet in length and uh, usually I have them pull out a string and run from one end of the classroom, clear out in the hallway, down the hall, down the steps, and out to the other room just so you can see how far that really is. Um, but just try and imagine, you know, looking out your window, whether it's a tree, the end of the driveway, depending on where you're at and what you have access to look at. But pick something out there that's about 80 feet long and think of that small intestine, you know, all wrapped up into their abdomen. Small intestine is really um, kind of the prime digestion and absorption place in the horse. It's where our fat, protein, and our carbohydrates in terms of our simple sugars, so not our structural fiber sugars, but our simple sugars are going to be digested and absorbed. The other thing is that the food moves through this portion relatively quickly. So you have a huge 80 feet length but really the food moves through there in about 45 minutes. It'll slow down a little bit as it nears the large intestine, but it does move through this area quite quickly. Um, and if you think about that, it's important that we're giving the horse feeds um, that enable that small intestine to maximize its efficiency. So to be able to get that fat digested and absorbed, the protein digested and absorbed, and those simple sugars digested and absorbed so that they can be used for energy before that feed is moving on into the large intestine. If we add up the digestive process that's occurring, um, basically when we add the stomach to the small intestinal portion, that's taking up about 55% of the digestion, so just over half. And the rest of the digestion is going to occur in the large intestine of the horse. So that's the large colon, the cecum, and the small colon that makes up that large intestine. So that first bullet on this slide says 65% of the GI tract. And some of you are going, wait a minute, didn't you just tell me 55% of the digestion was occurring with the stomach and small intestine? If I'm doing math correctly, Carrie, 55 and 65 does not add up to 100. However, what I'm saying here is that large intestine makes up 65% of the GI tract. So in terms of the anatomy portion, there's more large intestine than there is foregut of the horse. However, it's doing a smaller percentage of the actual digestion. So that stomach and small intestine is doing about 55% of the digestive capacity. Um, however, it's a smaller kind of portion of the total anatomy. So the large intestine is a big portion of the anatomy, but it does a little less of the digestive capacity of the horse. As I mentioned previously, there's three main sections, the cecum, the large colon, and the small colon. And that four part of the stomach and small intestine, you know, I mentioned was kind of the super highway. Things are moving through there pretty quickly, 45 minutes through um, the small intestine. But once it reaches the large intestine, it really slows down. And this is imperative. To have that slow movement through the large colon, the cecum, is what allows the fermentive microbes to be able to do their job, ferment the fibers that are there, and provide the volatile fatty acids that the horse can use for energy. If we add up the time from the stomach all the way through the small intestine, usually digest is getting to the cecum, the first part of the large intestine, in about three hours. So pretty quickly. However, it's going to stay there in that large intestine um, for about another two days. So if you think about that in terms of time, it's moving through the first part of the GI tract incredibly rapidly, and then it's sitting in that large fermentation vat for about two more days to make sure that we can get the nutrients out. The large intestine is also incredibly important for water reabsorption. 
Um, so about 50 to 90 percent of the water in this area will be reabsorbed so that the horse can have that available to the body. Um, and this, especially when we start to get into the summer months, it's important to make sure that we have adequate water out for horses because one of the things that happens if the horse doesn't have enough water in their environment to drink is that they will start to pull even more water out of the large colon, the cecum, the small colon, and what happens is those fecal matter gets even more dry and you can start to have impaction or uh, problems with the fecal matter getting stuck and not moving through correctly. So especially as we move into these warm summer months, um, just a reminder to make sure we get plenty of water to our animals. And this is another one of those kind of scary anatomical slides, but this is what that large colon looks like when it's kind of, and the large intestine is it's all curled up in the horse's body. And so just to orient you a little bit, as you're looking at the screen, the horse's head would be off to your right, the horse's tail would be off to your left. Uh, the first thing we see right in front of us is the cecum and then kind of back in towards the far part of your screen. Um, you may be able to see the words, the pelvic flexure, that is part of the large colon. So just to kind of, as you can imagine, this kind of sitting in this U shape towards the back of the abdomen of the horse. So the cecum, as I mentioned, as you look at this picture on your screen, um, is this kind of comma-shaped sac that sits uh, in the horse's abdomen. It's situated mainly on the right side of the horse. It begins about near their right hip bone and kind of extends forward along the bottom of their abdomen, kind of towards the middle of their abdomen probably. Holds about six to eight gallons and is a major fermentation vat. So it's the first place really that the fibrous feed, the grasses, the hay that we feed the animal are starting to mix with the microorganisms and allow those microorganisms to break down that feed into a usable form for the horse's body. The large colon is the next part of that intestine, so the food enters into the cecum, leaves the cecum and enters the large colon, and again, this is a huge microbial fermentation place. So 38% of the gastrointestinal tract in terms of, of the volume it holds, 20 to 24 gallons, um, I usually think of this as a garbage can, the, the typical, you know, 20 to 25 gallon garbage can that you, you'd haul out to your curb to be able to, to dump your garbage for the garbage man um, is about the capacity of what that will hold. And just to kind of give you a visual too, um, one of the things I do for class for students is we fill that about half full of hay and then fill it up with water and I let those students try to pick it up and carry it just for an idea of the weight that that large colon can hold and uh, you know that that horse has to carry as they're working. So I talked a little bit about you know these microbes that are fermenting this fibrous feed in the cecum and the large colon and they are incredibly important to the horse. They aid not only in the digestive process and breaking down the feeds into a usable form, um, and they do this to provide that animal with essential nutrients. They provide what are called volatile fatty acids. The horse can then absorb these into their bloodstream and use them for energy. They can turn them into fat to store for energy, or they can um, turn them into glucose to be able to be used um, directly for whatever that horse might be doing for work, whether it's running a race or whether it's grazing around the pasture. Microbes also produce vitamins. Um, they will produce B vitamins and they'll produce vitamin K. Something that we don't always think about, you know, is that microbes will 
provide vitamins to a horse. However, when you have horses that are stressed or you have horses that are in disease situations, a lot of times those microbes can't provide the amount of vitamins that that horse's body is consuming, whether it's because the microbes themselves are diminished in population or whether it's just the horse's body is consuming them at a greater rate than the horse's microbes can produce. So this is one we often talk with owners about their animal um, and whether or not we need to supplement these vitamins. The microbes are also important to develop normal development of the GI tract and the immune system. I think a lot of times owners get worried the thought of bacterial colonies and bacterial populations growing in their horse's intestine. Um, but there are lots of bacteria that are wonderful organisms. We always think of them in, in kind of the bad nature and the diseases they cause, but there's a lot of very beneficial and good bacteria that do wonderful things to make sure that that GI tract develops normally, especially young foals. Um, getting their GI tract colonized with the correct microbes is incredibly important to help them survive and be help, help them be able to kind of utilize forages the way they should. The final thing that we always think about these microbes in the GI tract doing is when you have the normal good populations of bacteria working the way they should, their levels of health and growth basically suppress the growth of what we would consider the bad bacteria or the ones that cause disease. And I think one of the best examples I can give of that um, is a disease example. There are some times in horses um, that we need to give them antibiotics. And if you think about antibiotics, they don't always know which are good, which are bad bacteria. And so they may enter the gut and take out and kill off all of the bacterial in that animal's intestine. And then what you see is this overgrowth of some of the bad bacteria, the disease-causing bacteria, and you may see diarrhea. And that's why not only in humans, sometimes they'll tell you if you're taking antibiotics, a side effect may be diarrhea or to watch for that. And it's the same thing we say in our horses, watch them closely for diarrhea, because that may mean that we're getting an imbalance in that horse's GI tract with the disease-causing bacteria overtaking the good bacteria. When that happens, um, like I said, we start to see disease issues instead of kind of this healthy digestion that we want to see in that hind gut. All right, if we move out of anatomy and move a little more into feeding guidelines and think about kind of why we feed our horses what we do. The nutrient requirements for horses um, are divided up basically based on their stage of life. We feed them for maintenance, we feed them for pregnancy, we feed them for growth, as well as performance or our work animals. Um, and I think this is a little bit different. Those of you, if you're used to feeding cattle um, or swine, we talk about feeding animals with their net energy for gain in our feedlot animals, um, net energy for lactation in our um, lactating, especially the dairy cattle. But with horses, we, we talk about it more in terms of maintenance animals for our pasture animals, as I like to think of them, our pasture pets. Um, our pregnancy, our growing horses, our weanlings, our two-year-olds, and then our work animals, whether that's race horses, ranch horses, and even some of our pleasure horses will fall into that category a little bit. I do want to cover a little bit before I talk any more on kind of our feeding guidelines about the body condition score. If you're not familiar with body condition score in horses, um, you should be. It's one of the best ways we have to monitor our horses as to whether they're gaining or losing weight and whether we have them kind of at an ideal weight where we would want them to be. In horses, it's considered a score of one to nine. And we measure them based on the amount of fat that we see at their neck, their withers, along their back, so kind of whether they have a crease down their spine or not, over their ribs, and a little bit behind the shoulder. 
and then as well as kind of around their tailhead area that horses get and get some real patchy fat around their tailhead as they start to get obese. Now depending on whose guidelines you read, you'll either hear four to six or five to seven kind of considered the ideal range. One would be extremely thin, nine would be extremely obese, and so like I said, four to six or five to seven kind of depending on whose guidelines you're looking at is what we think of as the ideal animal. I'm not going to go through each of these scores kind of in depth, but what I want you to see is what's in red, which is the normal score for horses, so a four to six. Um, and that is basically the moderately thin to moderately fleshy category. And I think all too often, um, or all too often, we worry about and try to keep our horses probably a little fatter than they need to be. If you look at number four, or a body condition score of four, they are not obviously thin, but you can see ribs. And so I think a lot of times, and I hear that a lot from owners or from people who are watching other horses, is they say, while that horse is thin, you can see its ribs. Well, not necessarily. Um, being able to see a little bit of ribs, especially depending on what that horse's um, career is, if they are a racehorse, being lean and in shape is incredibly important. Um, whereas in a broodmare, we might want them to be carrying a little more fat and a little more flesh to be able to provide some nutrients for that foal, or maybe they have to ha kind of winter through a tough winter and have a little extra capacity and a little extra energy kind of stored. But you know, just because you can see ribs doesn't necessarily mean they are too thin. It does depend a little bit on what their work category is. And I do want to stress that they're just moderately thin. There's a difference when the ribs are easily discernible as to kind of when they're faintly visible. This slide kind of gives you a little better imagery of that as just opposed to the words on the screen. Um, I think all of us would have no problem looking at the horse in the upper left, our horse with a body condition score of one, and saying that that horse is too thin. You know, the, the vertebrae along the spine are easily visible. Um, the ribs are easily visible. You can see the hip bones. If you would feel that animal, you'd probably be able to feel every kind of bony process all along that animal's shoulders, hips, spine. Um, and that's definitely too thin. For horse number four, I know that some of us probably look at that animal and say, he's too thin. But that body condition score four, um, in our athletes, our racing horses, some of our performance horses, that would be what I would like to see. I'd like to be able to faintly see those ribs. Um, horse number body condition score a six in our lower left, that's probably what most of us are kind of used to seeing is, is more ideal, a horse that carries a little more cover over its ribs, over its spinous area, um, and that is perfect for a lot of our pleasure horses and working horses, um, but maybe a little too heavy for some of our high athletes. And then obviously the horse in the lower right, um, I think as we start to look at that and see the, the crest to the neck and some of the pudgy fat bulges around the tail head of that animal, um, we can start to recognize that that one's probably starting to be obese. If we talk about energy requirements for those different classes of horses, um, there are two main things that will provide energy to the horse, and those are carbohydrates and fat. We can use protein for energy, however, it doesn't work as efficiently, um, and so a horse's body would prefer not to use protein for energy if it has the chance to use the others, um, and when designing diets and kind of thinking about nutrition of the horse, we want to have it using carbohydrates and or fat. You know, lately carbohydrates have kind of been getting a bad rap, and we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about equine metabolic syndrome at the end of the um, webinar tonight. But carbohydrates are still going to be the main energy source in the diet. And there are two 
kind of branches of carbohydrates. We have structural carbohydrates, which are basically the plant structure, and that actually is more of our fibrous feed. If you're going to find it in hay, you're going to find it in grasses. And then there's also what gets kind of the bad name for carbohydrates, which are the sugars and the simple sugars. Um, like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but do remember that there's two forms. So not all carbohydrates are bad. We still have fiber that is considered carbohydrates too, and this is going to be the main energy source for the horse's diet. As a general recommendation, and this is a normal 1,000-pound horse, you don't want to have their intake of concept traits be higher than 15 pounds per day. Obviously some of our bigger warm bloods draft horses are going to need more than that, um, and especially some of our high performance racehorse types will need more than that. But as a general guideline when I'm talking with um, producers that just kind of have the average horse out to pasture or in kind of an average workload, I don't want them feeding more than 15 pounds per day and definitely trying to get them to feed less than 5 pounds at concentrate per feeding. So they might have to break that out over 3, 4 um, feedings during the day to kind of get that to work out. And usually if you're getting to those upper levels of concentrates, um, moving to more of a fat-based diet becomes important because fats can provide um, about 2.5 times more energy than a carbohydrate can, and so having that um, it can be beneficial for the horse owner um, in terms of not having to feed as much concentrate if they can add some fat on top of the diet. If we look at protein requirements, a mature horse requires about 8 to 10 percent crude protein, um, and it's important to know that exercise doesn't really increase this requirement greatly. I think a lot of times horse owners get caught into this advertising game of we need to feed our horse a high protein feed, when in reality we usually don't need to feed them a super high protein feed. Usually the increase in protein requirement that a high level working horse has um, is usually met just by feeding them more of their diet. As you increase the diet to meet their energy needs, you'll meet their protein needs. The time when this isn't true is when you have a young growing horse that's also a working horse. So those yearlings and two year olds that are getting um, fit and worked for shows, for sales, um, or beginning their riding, they may actually need a higher protein um, to meet their growth needs for their uh, tendons and muscle capacity. And vitamin and mineral requirements. Horses that are stabled inside um, may require some additional vitamin supplementation. One of the big ones is vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin. Horses' bodies will make vitamin D when they're outside exposed to sun. Um, those that are stabled indoors for prolonged periods of time, and when I mean that, I'm, it's not just a week or two at a time, but if they're inside for months at a time, which some of our show horses to keep a nice shiny coat, they may be inside for eight months, nine months, a year, two years, um, and so supplementing some vitamins can become beneficial for them. It's also important to remember as hay is stored, it will lose its levels of vitamin A and E. So I always remind horse owners if they're feeding hay that's a year old um, that they may want to think about supplementing some extra vitamins. The electrolytes, sodium, potassium, and chloride um, are often supplemented as well, especially summer months when the horses are sweating. Those electrolytes are lost through sweat, and so it can be beneficial to add those back into the diet as well. All right, moving into our abnormalities. So kind of when things go wrong in the horse. What are some of the common ones? And like I mentioned, what maybe can we do to adjust diet or help manage this when it occurs? Figured I'd start with the most common one, which is gastric ulcers. 
Horses are incredibly prone, it seems like, to develop ulcers. And basically all that is is an erosion of the lining of the stomach. And it can be um, kind of mild, where it's just a, a mild surface layer of the um, epithelium in the stomach that is being eroded, or they can be quite severe where it penetrates into deeper layers and can cause bleeding um, and is obviously a much bigger concern to the horse's performance and health. They estimate that 50% of the population is affected, so that's huge if you think of basically one out of two horses has some sort of ulcer issue. All ages, all breeds, um, foals up through performance horses. There's even been reports out showing that 80 to 95 percent of race horses may have ulcers. That's a huge amount um, when you think about the population and number of animals affected. And we used to blame ulcers completely on um, management, saying that it's horses, it's the race horses, you know, the horses that are in stalls, being fed high levels of grain, being worked really hard. However, they've done studies now where they've simply pulled broodmares that are out to pasture in and uh, taken an endoscope and looked at their stomach lining and they're able to find ulcers in those animals. So it's not quite as simple as we used to think that it was strictly a, a high stress, high performance environment, high grain environment. Um, even our pasture animals, some of them seem to have problems with ulcers. When looking at some of the main symptoms and main risk factors for ulcers, um, what we see in terms of symptoms and what we'd see in our horse that's not acting right would be a poor appetite. Maybe they're not eating well. Um, one of the big ones it seems like I see is the horse will not eat its grain, but it still seems to eat its hay. So it's not that they're not eating at all but they're just not eating like they were. So they're leaving their grain, they're eating their hay. Maybe they're not training as well. So you have decreased performance, decreased ability to ride like they were. Sometimes they'll become cinchy. So that horse that pins its ears, swings its head, maybe tries to kick a little when you're tightening up the girth, all of that, you know, kind of indicating some pain in their, in their abdomen area. You may see them start to lose body condition. So they're not keeping the weight on like they were, and they may be so severe that the horse starts to show you signs of colic. Um, one of the cardinal signs in young foals are foals that roll up on their back. And I'll have the owners that tell me, oh, isn't he so cute? Look, he rolls over on his back for you to scratch his stomach. Well, actually, that's not a normal position for a horse, and they do that when they're in pain, and they're trying to relieve that pain by rolling over and trying to move you know, stomach contents around. Um, so that's, I always say that's kind of one of the cardinal signs in foals. When you see them rolling up and kind of laying on their back outside somewhere or in their stall, then you'd worry a little bit about ulcers. We do know that some of the risk factors are definitely high concentrate diets, so feeding them large amounts of grain. Horses that have limited grazing and limited turnout, so those that are combined to stalls, um, those that are in an extremely intense exercise environment, and just any type of, of stress, whether it's travel, show, exercise. And sometimes stress is as simple as changing herd dynamics. Some horses are very prone to kind of changes in their herd behavior. So when new horses are added or changed, um, that can cause ulcers in some of our horses. So like I mentioned earlier, we know some of these kind of high risk factors, but there's other things that we still don't always understand, you know, as to why some of our broodmares out to pasture would have problems with ulcers. But we do know, like I said, that it is a very frequent problem, and uh, I think every horse owner should be aware of ulcers because they are going to come across it at some point during their horse ownership career. If we move into colic, that's probably our second most common disease um, and or disorder, as I have right on there. It's not really a disease, but it's a generic term for abdominal pain. So it's something that's causing that horse's belly to hurt. Usually we think of it in terms of something related to the intestine that's causing 
the horse's abdomen to hurt, but it could be other things. Sometimes it's a bladder issue, sometimes it's a kidney issue that will manifest itself in terms of the horse showing pain about its abdomen, but normally we're thinking about it in terms of a problem with the GI tract. So if we think about that GI tract, what are some of the main things that causes that horse to colic? And one of them is that horses are unable to vomit. It has to do with the position of their stomach um, as well as how tight the entrance into the stomach is. There's a sphincter that regulates that entrance into the stomach called the cardiac sphincter. And in horses, that sphincter is very, very strong and very, very tight. So it opens for food to go into the stomach, but it rarely opens for food to come back out. So that tightness coupled with kind of how the horse's stomach is positioned um, can be a real problem. And what that means is that as that horse's stomach expands, their stomach is actually more apt to rupture than it is for the horse to vomit. So as you can imagine, that's a very um, dire thing for a horse owner and doesn't bode well for survival of the animal. Horses are also prone to colic just due to the makeup of their GI tract. If you think back to those slides when I showed you the large intestine, the twists and turns, that little hairpin U-turn I pointed out called the pelvic flexure in the large colon. Um, you know, you're, you're going against gravity, you're changing diameter. I usually use the visual of think of you driving along an interstate and you're in a four-lane interstate and suddenly you do a hairpin U-turn back the other direction and you go from four lanes of traffic down to two. If you think about that, how much that would clog and slow the movement of traffic, it's the same thing for the ingesta of the horse as it's moving through that GI tract. It slows, it changes, and if it starts to get dry, it starts to get stuck. So we've got a little bit of anatomy that kind of predisposes them to, to colic issues as well. Um, but we can help to kind of manage that and keep things moving through there correctly. And this slide has the visual of some of those changes and turns. Um, there's some dots that are showing that the base of the cecum, the entrance and the exit to the cecum are in about the same place. So they're both there at what's considered the base of the cecum, so at the top. So food enters and has to exit out of that same area, so which can be a problem. That little U-turn I told you about, the pelvic flexure, you can see in that drawing how the diameter from the lower portion changes and becomes much narrow along the top. And uh, as you would imagine, that's a prime place where things will get stuck. We have three main causes of kind of intestinal related colic in the horse. Gas colic, incredibly common, and just as some of you that have maybe had gas pain before, it can be quite painful. And to a horse, you know, they don't understand what that is, they just know that things are painful. And, uh, you know, as an owner, if I have to hope for something that my horse might have, I guess it would be this, because it is relatively treatable um, and usually relatively easy to treat. On the other hand, when you have the intestine that becomes displaced or twisted on itself, torsion, um, those are often surgical cases. So that's, that's not something that's just going to fix itself if you wait a little bit. And then impaction. This is our colic that happens when the food gets too dry or it doesn't get digested well enough and it gets stuck. So when I talked earlier about making sure your horse has plenty of water in the summer months, this is a big one to help prevent that fecal matter from drying out and getting stuck as it moves through that small intestine. It's also where it's important to have good quality hay sources so that you have some readily fermentable um, fiber sources in the large intestine. If you get some really coarse, fibrous, overmature type of hay, the microorganisms aren't able to digest that well, and it again will kind of get stuck and plug things up as it moves through the large intestine. We get some other causes of colic. Um, enteritis is just an infection that occurs in the small intestine, very painful for the horse. Enteroliths are 
kind of an odd occurrence, but I was telling her to think about the formation of a pearl. So it's a small grain of sand or something that gets in the small intestine and then the horse, or in the large intestine, and the horse lays mineral around and around and around that until it becomes big and large. Um, Enterolis can be as large as a cantaloupe, a watermelon, um, so you can get these massive rocks kind of inside the horse's abdomen. Parasites, sand, and then ulcers all can cause the horse to show signs of colic. What do we do to prevent it? I've harped on the water thing, I think, enough. Um, avoid sudden changes in feed. And this is one, you know, I think we all hear this, but owners often change feed pretty quickly. What happens is the microbes in a horse's large intestine are there based on the feed it's eating. So when you change feeds, the microbial populations have to change. And if they can't adapt quickly enough, um, you know, there's some things that can occur that sometimes lead to colic. Feed them off the ground, that's a sand issue to keep them from ingesting sand. Obviously regular deworming will help with parasites. And then dental exams, keeping their teeth good. If they can't chew their forage up properly, um, you get a lot of long stemmed forage in that hind gut, which is harder for the microbes to kind of digest properly. All right, hind gut acidosis. We're getting closer to the end, so everybody bear with me kind of through these last few slides, but this one is definitely a one we don't always think about, but it's becoming more and more common, especially um, as we think about our horses on high grain diets. The horse's GI tract is not designed for these large grain meals. And when you have large amounts of grain and our simple sugars that are in grain that escape the small intestine, so because of the speed that things move through the small intestine, that large amount, some of that feeds escaping and getting back into the large colon, um, those sugars are then fermented there by the bacteria. And the bacteria, as they ferment these sugars, it basically changes the pH. You get death of the good bacteria, more and more of these bad bacteria pr proliferating, and they'll release some toxins. The horse may colic. It can even founder, um, all of which are not good things to have happen. This slide is basically going to show you the same thing I just talked about. It's just in a little more visual approach. You have this high grain intake coming in. It's increasing the amount of volatile fatty acids that the bacteria are producing, and it's increasing lactic acid, all of which are causing this change in pH or making basically the environment of the large colon more hostile to the good bacteria. So you get a decrease in our good fiber fermenting bacteria and an increase in these lactic acid or kind of some of our bad bacteria. Um, if it's just kind of a mild thing happening, the horse just will be off feed a little bit. They may or may not show you colic signs, but they kind of have a decrease in performance. They're, they just aren't right. They're not feeling their best. In severe cases, you get toxin release and you can get horses that actually founder off these high grain intakes. Or this would be the scenario, the horse that breaks out of its stall, gets into the feed room and eats 200 pounds of feed. This is the type of thing that you're worried about and why we worry about horses foundering in that instance. Okay, final one to talk about here, equine metabolic syndrome. Kind of has been a hot topic lately, a lot of research being done on it. But these are our easy keeper horses. Those horses, it seems like we don't feed at all and they're fat. Most common in the breeds, um, the ponies, Pasifinos, our warm bloods, our Spanish Mustangs, and our Morgans, although we can see it in any breed. Quarter horses, most definitely, we see cases of this as well, although it doesn't seem like we see it as often as we do these other breeds, especially ponies. Seems like we see lots of equine metabolic syndrome in ponies. The horse in this picture is actually one of our students' horses that when I uh, talked about this in class, she's like, oh my word, this is what my horse has. And uh, she's exactly right. This is a Spanish Mustang and uh, it fits the scenario. But they're horses that don't lose weight. 
with diet and exercise. A lot of times the mares have poor conception rates. They tend to have reoccurring problems with laminitis, but the typical look are these kind of pudgy fat horses. They have lots of fat on their neck, the big crusty necked horse. You'll see patches of fat around their tail head area. A lot of times in geldings you'll see even the fat around their prepuce area, so around their sheath they just are pudgy and fat. Um, and sometimes it's a little misleading because you might be able to see a little bit of ribs. So they may be thin over their rib area, but you still get this big, huge, crusty neck and, and patchy fat around their tail head. And what's happening is that in the horse's body, it's basically becoming resistant to insulin. Okay, So normally, insulin would help take the glucose or the sugar that's in the blood and help put it into the cell. Um, in these horses, that connection doesn't work quite right, and you get higher levels of blood glucose. And blood glucose or blood sugar is a good thing in small amounts, but in high levels, like everything, a little bit's good, but a lot can be a problem. And so when you get these higher levels, you start to get some bad toxic things that occur, and hence our laminitis issues in these horses. So what do we do to treat it and worry about it, a lot of it's diet and prevention. So we have to keep these horses weight um, managed and we do that usually with consistent exercise and low carbohydrate diets and you'll see all the companies talking about that now, these low carbohydrate diets, um, helping them in terms of keeping fiber production normalized so that hind gut working kind of smooth and efficiently is very important in these animals. Um, so feeding them more of kind of our fibrous feeds and less of our grains and carbohydrate feeds becomes incredibly important. And I'll kind of sum it up with my final slide that I think a lot of times as horse owners this is how we feel is that uh, we're feeding our horses just these piles and piles of feed that, that are money in and, and not always this output out that we would hope for but um, I think the more you know about nutrition, how to manage some of these issues and how to feed horses properly, you can minimize the amount of those dollars that are going in and kind of maximize the, the results that you see. And so with that, I'll kind of finish my formal part of this presentation and uh, hopefully everyone learned a little bit of something and I know it got a little long but I had a lot of information I wanted to share and I'd be glad to take any questions if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. All right, thanks, Dr. Hammer. We want to thank you for joining us. And we're not over yet, but this does include our formal presentation part of our webinar here tonight. And uh, want to just remind you that there's always a recorded copy of our webinars, including the question and answer period that we're going to be heading into next that's always available by going to the website at www.agribestfeeds.com. In a moment, I'll show you how to get there and how to find the recorded webinars, also register for upcoming webinars. But we do have some other panelists joining us tonight. I want to give them a quick opportunity to also maybe add a few comments. Brad Thornburg from, uh, uh, from uh, Sweet Pro and Equipride is joining us as well. And Brad, uh, is some additional comments that you would like to add. Yeah, just uh, say thank you, uh, Dr. Hammer, for that presentation. Um, that was very well put together, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> it was very, very well done. You did great on that. Um, just following up with a couple things, you know, speaking from the Equiprise and the horse side, or the uh, uh, business side of this thing, um, when you're talking about enzymes in the horses and all of that, uh, one of the things that we make us uh, at Bob would say a hallmark of the product uh, that we're doing with Equipride and Equilix is all of the viable enzymes that are left in the product uh, after manufacture. You know, barley malt for one of them being a, just a, a plethora of, of the enzymes that are coming from that. But uh, what we have there then is that amyletic, uh, fibrolytic, proteolytic, and phospholytic. So you're able to break down those starches and fibers and proteins and you know, and phytic acid and phosphorus, all with a, a live enzyme that's left in the product. So it helps along with you know, everything else. But I think going back to your emphasis on the, um, the microbials that are in that, um, in that hindgut and that whole microbiome there, uh, again, I think the emphasis uh, in Equipride and Equilex, one of the biggest parts, is that prebiotic uh, that's there, actually the 
several different, I think it's four different classes and three, uh, maybe four, um, that we could say is they are feeding all of those natural fiber digesting microbials that are already there, doing that with the more common FOS, which is that fructose oligosaccharide. Um, then you're dealing with um, uh, xylo oligosaccharide and uh, labino xylo and mannan oligosaccharide. And just a cool thing about the, how those things work together is that rabinoxylo is feeding all that difficult, you know, difficult bacteria, if I can say that right, those fiber digesters in that, uh, in that hindgut and building those populations and allowing them for, you know, to keep that pathogenic bacteria at bay through competitive exclusion. Um, but finding out more and more about, uh, especially, you know, Dr. Schaefer, Abe uh, Schaefer has been digging in the research on this, is that that man in oligosaccharide, that MLS, uh, really, if that particular fiber seems to, to be, to have like a docking station basically on that fiber for the salmonella and the E. coli and a number of these pathogenics, that they basically grab onto that instead of onto the wall of the intestine and you're flushing them out the door. And, it's, and see, we're seeing that happen in Europe right now where they're banning anti antibiotics in a lot of the farm animal farm production and the poor guys are saying, hey, you know, wait a second, animal gets sick, uh, what do we do with the herds? And they're feeding them man and oligosaccharide, that MOS, and it is really helping to flush those pathogens. So, you know, you were talking about the ulcers and all the other issues that uh, I know Equipride does help uh, address, but wanted to key in on those things, and I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks, Brad. And, of course, uh, Brad uh, joining us as well for tonight as a panelist. So if we do have any questions about Equipride or the Equilex products as well, uh, he is more than welcome to answer any of those questions. At this time, uh, we do want to give you some opportunity to ask any questions. Easy way for you to do it. Raise your hand. We'll know you have a question, or you can also type it out, and uh, we'll go to you as well that way. So a couple easy ways to do that. We do have one question coming in uh, from Christy Brantley, who's out of Zorky, Montana. And the question is, what kind of grain do you recommend for a treat-type grain? So, Dr. Hammer, I'll push that out to you for that question again. It was, what kind of grain would you recommend for a treat-type grain? Well, and I, I guess I, I'm kind of wondering if you're meaning a treat type grain. So the, this horse is already an easy keeper, so it's the kind that maybe you just want to give a, a handful of grain to, or or that type of thing, as opposed to you know one that's actually needing a couple pounds of grain to maintain its weight. Um, and in that case, I, I like to stick to something that's, I guess, a little less kind of maybe corn and oat based and a little more rice bran, beet pulp type based. Um, there are some treats marketed that are kind of the, you know, low cal, less molasses, less corn and oats and more um, rice bran oriented. And I probably would lean towards that a little bit. Um, one of the other options, there are, I guess, what's termed kind of some some balancer pellets that are kind of made for horses that are just on um, those easy keeper horses that are basically just on grass or hay type diets and a lot of times they will eat those as kind of a treat um, you know and it helps them feel like they're getting a little grain if their neighbors are getting some um, and I hope maybe that's kind of what you were thinking about if if you want something that's a little more substance in terms of just kind of the handful grain type treat uh, let me know because I can talk a little more about that as well all right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christy, for joining us. Again, Christy from Absorkey, Montana. Going to give you a more opportunity to ask questions, and while we are waiting for more questions to come in, I do just want to quick remind you that uh, an easy way for you to go to the uh, and listen to any past websites or past webinars that we've had, if you notice on your screen, you can go to agribestfeeds.com. There's a website, www.agribestfeeds.com. And if you click on the register for our monthly producer informational webinars, click onto that box there as that comes up there. We'll give everybody a chance for that to come in into your screen there. Not only can you see our webinar that we are on today, the 14th of May, but then you can also look down through there 
and you can see the, the uh, shortcut there for click here for past recorded webinars and there you can listen to all the various ones that we've had over the years as we've had several we're on a variety of different topics as well I want to remind you while you're there too to sign up for the newsletter if you haven't done that already I would encourage you to do, to do that because not only do they uh, give you an update of what's coming down the pike or new things and in innovative, invade, uh, inventive ways, excuse me, that uh, the product is available and can be used. Uh, that is the easiest way for you to get, stay informed of what's going on with AgriBest Feeds. There you can sign up for their newsletter. And I want to encourage you to do that. We do have some questions coming in. I want to give uh, some opportunities here for that. And uh, this is from uh, Debbie Pl uh, Plekin, and sorry Debbie if I got your name wrong, you know you're from Hewlett, Wyoming and I should probably know you because that's where I was raised, but uh, Debbie I don't know if you got your mic on, I'm going to unmute your microphone and if you want to ask your question uh, over the air I'll let you do that, I've got your microphone unmuted and uh, if I don't hear anything from you I'll just go ahead and, and, uh, and read your question out to the audience here as well, but uh, here's, the, here's the question. What what are your thoughts on extruded feeds? And the, uh, the furthering the question is, they want she wants to work with several rescue horses and have, uh, and the greatest challenge with the, uh, boy, there's some scientific words there with some dwarf miniatures. And I don't know, uh, Dr. Hammer, if you can see that same question as well as I can. Uh, it's uh, the smallest, 22 inches, seven years more. S a severe and other inner dwarfism because we don't know what all is going on in her little body. She's been using the extruded feet along with some shredded beet pulp with grass hay. What are your thoughts? And I don't know, Dr. Hammer, if you can see that question from Debbie, uh, but uh, you want to answer her question. Yeah, I, uh, I actually can't see the question, or at least I can't figure out where to click to be able to see it. <laughs> um, but I actually we have quite a few horses at the barn that we feed extruded feeds to um, and we've been very happy with it um, the extruded feeds we've used I have very much liked um, it seems as though sometimes it's a little difficult to get the horses to start eating it you know it, it looks a little bit like dog food it looks a little different to them um, so if they're real texture oriented it seems like sometimes they have a little difficulty switching over although we have yet to have one that we haven't been able to get switch over sometimes it takes a few feedings for them to kind of figure it out but um, we've never had one that completely refuses to eat it and so I guess I would not feel bad about um, using an extruded feed at all it's more kind of what is in that feed that that's probably most important as opposed to the processing type that that makes it but you know those those dwarf miniatures um, you know sometimes can have some some special GI issues and feeding them a, a very fermentable um, kind of low carbohydrate diet I think would be beneficial and the, the shredded beet pulp would be fine I would have no qualms with that I am actually one who kind of loves to use beet pulp in diets if I can so beet pulp rice bran is another great one that adds some fat source if you need some energy to kind of give them some calories uh, so that would definitely be be an option and yeah I like I said again I love the extruded feeds no qualms about that at all all right, thanks, Debbie, for your question. Brad, any comments on that? No, nope, I think we're yeah, she got it. Okay. All right, again, we don't want to rush off everybody here too far. And if, uh, Debbie, if you have more questions on that, just go ahead and post your question again, and we can go back to you. Again, we want to give everybody ample opportunity here for questions tonight. As I said just a moment ago, uh, if you want to sign up for any upcoming webinars or newsletter, go to the website for that. I do want to remind you that if you have any questions about the products that we've talked about tonight, I encourage you to contact your dealer that invited you on tonight's webinar or give, uh, feel free to give AgriBest Feeds a call at their toll-free number. There you can see at the very top right-hand side of the screen, it's 1-866-601-6646 about all of their products, the Equilix, Equipride products, or the Sweet Pro products for cattle or your Redmond Mineral products as well, just a variety of things that, uh, that uh, they ha can uh, help you with and get answer your questions with as well. I'm going to go to uh, Scott Anderson, who's uh, one of our panelists joining us as well tonight with AgriBest Feeds. Scott, uh, you've got a question, so I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you very much, Justin, and thank you, Dr. Hammer, for your excellent presentation. Um, I had a question on the equine metabolic syndrome. Uh, is that basically kind of like the diabetic uh, response that we're having in humans? It is real similar. Um, humans have a very similar metabolic syndrome. Um, it's a little different kind of in mechanism than just strict diabetes, um, but it, it it is kind of similar along the lines of, of treatment and some of the issues we see, especially with, with the weight gain. Um, but yes, short answer, definitely humans have a metabolic syndrome that is very similar to this metabolic syndrome problem that we're seeing in horses. Thank you. All right, thanks for the question. Any other questions here tonight? Again, we don't want to rush off, but uh, we don't definitely want to keep you, keep you too long as well. As we're kind of waiting for some questions, I'll kind of go through some of our panelists for some final, uh, d final uh, comments. Uh, Brad Thornberg, of course, joining us from, uh, Equi from the Equipride and Equilix products. And Brad, some final comments. Yeah, no, just again to uh, appreciate what uh, Dr. Hammer uh, put together there uh, in, the, in the whole process. And uh, just was thinking uh, real quickly about ulcers uh, and how so prevalent they are. But it seems like horses that are on Equipride regularly just don't seem to have that issue when we've got uh, reports of that from all over the country. And it just makes them work. Uh, whereas, like, even thinking about racehorses and, and the ulcers that they have, uh, the animals, when they are going you know, into the slot uh, or into the gate to run, you don't have all that nervous energy and they're not running around and, you know, and having a problem with it. They know what to do once they get in there. They go. But, um, again, you just don't have the same levels of nervousness. Uh, and training seems to do better when they're on it this way and they are able to focus and, uh, and learn. But they just don't seem to have the ulcer issues uh, when they're using Equipride. So that'll do it. But again, thank you very much, Dr. Hammond, for that report. All right. Thanks, Brad, for joining us tonight. We appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to join us as well. Uh, Scott Anderson, of course, uh, joining us with uh, AgriBest. And uh, Scott, before I have you, before I uh, go to you for your final comments, I do have a question coming in from Dan Marsh. And the question is, is a 10-year-old horse with a crested neck who foundered last year, and they have him on hay and Equipride. He's wanting to know what else can they do to re reduce the fat deposit in his neck. Yeah, some of those horses, once they they kind of get that crusty neck, it can be an issue. Um, and you can try one of the grazing muzzles. Um, I guess the question truly is, is he still quite obese or not, you know, is one of the, the big questions is some of these horses can have the, the crusty neck but have seemed to kind of shed the body calories other places. And, you know, a 10-year-old horse, I wouldn't expect to have that huge crusty neck issue. Some of our older horses can. They seem to just, once it's there, they can't seem to be able to get rid of it. Um, but one suggestion if he still is having some weight management issues is to try the grazing muzzle. Um, you know, they just slip over the horse's head and they've got little holes in the end which makes it a little more difficult for the horse to either get at their hay or to pull their blades of grass through. Um, so it lets them still be out to pasture or still out eating but yet restricts their intake and can kind of help shed some of those last calories if needed. And Dan's adding uh, on that, Dr. Hammer, that he has shed most of his excess weight but, he, but retains the neck fat. Okay. You know, and that issue, sometimes those guys are tough. You know, especially the way the neck is made up, there's a big ligament that runs along the top side of the neck. And one of the things that happens with a ligament is there's not huge blood supply to a ligament. So if they get a lot of fatty deposits in around that area, it seems like it's just really hard to get the blood supply there to get rid of that. And, you know, you can try some of the, the old tried and true neck sweat neoprene type of things, but it may just be something that anatomically he's, he's going to carry for a while. All right. Thanks, Dan. Marsh for your question. Dan joining us out of Bozeman, Montana here tonight. 
Another question coming in from Debbie out of Hewlett, Wyoming. One last question she's wanting to know is, what are your thoughts regarding supplementing with omega-3? She says it seems to be a hot product lately and wants to know again, what are your thoughts regarding supplementing with omega-3? So sure, the omega-3 versus omega-6 fatty acid argument, um, the idea that the way the omega-6 fatty acids are used in the body, that they can, and that it's true that they are used in an inflam inflammation pathway. Um, and so by moving more to these omega-3 fatty acids, you should decrease inflammation in the body, um, you know, with the idea that you would have a healthier animal. Um, yes, I, the science I've seen behind it is pretty sound. Um, I, the downside is you really have to know, though, whether your horse needs it or not. I think that's the baseline. So many times as owners, we get caught up in, in marketing and advertising and we're willing to try something. But the question is, do we have an issue? So if the horse has allergy issues or it has arthritis issues or inflammation issues of some sort where you know there's inflammation going on in that horse's body, then supplementing more omega-3 fatty acids probably is of benefit. Um, if you have a really healthy horse that doesn't have inflammation issues, um, paying the money for that type of supplement probably isn't needed. All right, thanks for the question, Debbie. Thanks for joining us from Hewlett, Wyoming here tonight. We'll go to Scott Anderson now with AgriBest Feeds for some final comments. Um, Justin, does Ann have a question there? Oh, is there a hand raised up here? I didn't see. Oh, I think so. Ann, I'm gonna. Sorry about that, Ann. I didn't uh, see you there. I've got you. Got your hand raised. I'm gonna unmute your microphone. If you want to go ahead and ask your question, you can do that. Are you there? If you're having difficulty or don't have a microphone, you can just type it out there too, and we'll. I'll have Scott do some comments here, and then if your question comes in, we'll definitely want to give you the opportunity to ask it. So, Scott, some questions here? Or some, Our, some comments, excuse me. Yeah, once again, thanks again, uh, Dr. Hammer. Uh, some of the things that I just want to pull out on uh, what we've heard back from people using Equipride, Equilix products is that they're getting peak performance from their horses without the horses getting hot. Uh, they're performing better on less feed, so that's one of the things we haven't uh, talked about uh, this evening, but on some of our past webinars, we, we see that um, horses will actually eat 20-25% uh, less feed, break that feed down better, uh, and become because of all of the things that Dr. Hammer were, was talking about there with the mi microbial activity and so forth, so on. And then also just the Redmond Natural Trace Mineral Salt with the 60 plus naturally occurring trace minerals in the crystalloid form is just an excellent uh, a mineral foundation uh, to have out free choice on the horses and and we certainly appreciate it it's always exciting to hear our different um, webinar pre presenters whether it's on the cattle side or the horse side it just seems like the science um, that's out there and the science the sweet pro redmond uh, equipride equilix uh, all just seem to fit so excellently together so I certainly appreciate your time, Dr. Hammer, and thanks so much, Brad, for being on uh, from Sweet Pro tonight as well. Thank you, Justin, for your great effort um, with us all the time on your hosting. All right. Thanks, Scott. And, of course, we do thank AgriBest Feeds for hosting these webinars. Um, we do have uh, Anne's uh, is able to type her question to me, so I'll go ahead and read it out here for, uh, for you here. Thanks, Anne, for doing that. The question is, have you found any connections between cribbing and digestion? Does vitamin C help with metabolizing, um, for, for metabolizing uh, hay and glucosamine? Uh, they currently have a horse on Equipride that came to them six weeks ago in, uh, in number two condition. The horse is on pasture, gaining well, but somewhat uh, so far, or somewhat uh, the stool and dark. Something I'm having a hard time reading some of the words there. So. Did you get the gist of the question there, Dr. Hammer? Oh, the 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 uh, hyaluronic acid is what she was talking about. 
Oh, okay. Um, so, well, it sounds like there's kind of multiple parts to this question. Um, and I guess starting with the first part in relation to cribbing and diet, um, cribbing is a tough one. And, you know, those horses, once they've kind of developed that behavior, it, it doesn't seem like it is something that that you can just fix. Um, you know, we used to think that it was because horses were in stalls or because they were in, um, you know, a certain type of environment. But what the research has shown is even if those horses are out in a big pasture, they will find a way to find a fence post or a tree stump or a rock or whatever it might be out in their pasture to be able to crib on. Um, so it is somewhat of a kind of this you know, I don't know if you want to think of them as as the type A obsessive compulsive human that, you know, obsessively washes their hands or cleans their house or whatever that might be. For, for that horse's personality, it tends to be cribbing. Um, in, I guess that next part of your question, um, Justin, you might have to help yeah. read some yeah, of that to me again, it. but it was vitamin C and... Does it help with metabolizing uh, hyaluronic acid and glucosamine. Glucosamine. Okay, so glucosamine and hyaluronic acid are um, components that we think of in terms of joint supplements, so keeping joints um, healthy and lubricated. Uh, vitamin C, you know, it might play a little bit of a role in that. I've not seen any good research done showing that like additional vitamin C would be beneficial for those animals. Um, the horse's body will produce vitamin C itself. Um, they make it from glucose. So, you know, that research where additional vitamin C would, would be beneficial for those compounds, um, I, I just haven't, haven't seen that. Okay, and I think we got, she just had mentioned that currently they have a horse on Equipride that came to them about six weeks ago in two condition the horse is on pasture gaining well, uh, but the stool is somewhat soft and a bit blackish. And I guess the next question I would have too in terms of the stool and a bit blackish, sometimes you worry if it's a bit black that there might be some um, digested blood in there would be to make sure from the veterinary side, you know, that it's been dewormed so that we don't have a parasite issue and just to make sure that there's not some other type of health issue in terms of ulcers that might be causing some blood loss into the GI tract. Um, one thing I remind owners, especially when they've got horses that are that are thin, um, is it does take a long time to put that weight back on. Um, we figure at least 50 pounds per body condition score that that horse has to gain. Um, so if you're at a two and trying to get them up to a three, they're going to need to gain at least 50 pounds. Um, and that isn't going to happen in a week or two weeks. You know, that it's going to happen over over four weeks, over eight weeks. Um, so you're looking at, at months worth of time to get those horses back up to weight. It's amazing how quickly a horse can lose weight we just have to remind ourselves to be real patient that it takes them quite a while to gain weight. But I guess with this one, my first instinct would be let's make sure that there's not an underlying health issue. Dark, loose feces kind of makes me think there might be an underlying medical issue that we might want to look at first. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ann, for your question. Between Ann and Debbie here tonight, they've stumped me with a couple scientific words I usually can do pretty good on, but tonight <laughs> kind of rough on some of these words. So... Uh, but again, we appreciate you guys' questions. They're definitely very good questions. And I know, uh, Dr. Hammer, you just got finished uh, answering a the question there, but I guess any final comments for everybody here tonight? Um, I, guess, I guess I don't. It's just always remember, you know, I think as horse owners, the biggest thing is to just look at your animal. Um, sometimes I think we get so stuck into reading advertisements or this sales pitch or that sales pitch um, and you know your horse will tell you wonders if their coat is shiny if they are in good weight if they are working at their best um, you know then things are good but if they're not at their best if their coat's not shiny if they're showing you signs that something is amiss a lot of times it's a nutritional issue um, and spend the time to to work with somebody that can help you get that diet changed around and get them back to where they need to be. 
All right. Well, on behalf of AgriBest Feeds, uh, Dr. Hammer, thanks for joining us tonight. A great presentation, a lot of information, very good questions as well coming following our presentation tonight. I want to thank all of our panelists as well for joining us as well as it was uh, definitely a very extremely informative uh, webinar here tonight. Again, on behalf of AgriBest Feeds, we thank you. We thank Dr. Hammer for being our presenter here tonight. And uh, for those, uh, if you just a reminder, go to agribestfeeds.com. Not only can you listen to tonight's webinar, but also other ones that we've had and get signed up for any upcoming webinars and that newsletter. If you have questions about the product, don't forget to give them a call as well. We thank you for joining us. I'm Justin Mills, and we'll see you on the next one.